Now we're going to be talking about hope and the church universal tonight. But as we get started, uh, Ken Privet has our opening prayer. Father, uh, we come to you tonight with praise and thanksgiving. Lord, open our our minds and our spirits to what we hear from David and from the group. We desire salvation, as John Wesley says, uh, by doing good and, and by attending to all of God's ordinances and, uh, and wishing and doing no harm. Father, grant us salvation. We're working on our salvation. And also, Lord, eliminate the, the gap between us and you in all ways. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Ken. Well, Chapter 9, The Christian Hope, 11 different questions. They begin with, how is hope essential to Christian faith? They say hope is at the core of Christian faith. The quote I pulled out of that section was, a confident expectation that God, who began a good work in creation, will bring it to completion. So... Not so much optimism that people are going to do everything right, but hope that God is at work, which will bring things to completion. Then they go on to discuss that the resurrection and Christ's victory over death is a sign of God's triumph in the end, that finally God will triumph. In 9-2, they say Jesus' resurrection was seen as a foretaste of God's final victory. 9.3, they discuss continuity and discontinuity around the biblical stories of Jesus' resurrection. They talk about how they recognize Jesus, yet he's not limited to normal physical existence. He passes through doors and things like that, disappears from a table. Uh, I think it is interesting, though, they did not mention and in most of the resurrection stories, the women disciples in the garden and the male disciples, like the road to Emmaus and other places, they don't recognize him when they first encounter him. Uh, I don't know why they didn't mention that. That seems like an important point to me, uh, that all these firsthand accounts, at least written as firsthand accounts, uh, it's not the exact same body. It's not like one of us walked out of the room and walked back in and we wouldn't recognize them. Uh, he has some kind of body, uh, but that's part of the confusion in Christian theology because of the biblical record is a little uneven uh, on that point. So uh, one of those uncertainties we grapple with. In 9.4, they go on to a discussion of immortality and resurrection. Talk about that Christians emphasize resurrection, although there's some biblical material about immortality, uh, that we don't assume that everybody lives forever or that the soul lives forever. Uh, but Jesus' resurrection is a sign that God will raise us uh, or there is life after death, that kind of thing. They say, of course, when people are describing immortality and resurrection, there are some similarities and some differences in terms of how those are described. But I thought this was a great line. They said it is best not, not to claim to know for certain what God has not chosen clearly to reveal. So, so often, I think, um, some Christians... Uh, claim more certainty than we really have. Uh, I think sometimes to our detriment. Um, but some people like certainty more than others. So uh, I just thought that was uh, a good line, not to claim more than God knows. Uh, in 9.7 to 9.8, they move into discussing sort of some predictions and theology that comes out of those books uh, and this whole idea of a rapture that some are going to be saved or taken up and others not. Um, the problem with both Daniel and Revelation is that people take them as literal descriptions, even though in the books, the authors say these are visions. Seems like to me, 
again, we should trust the author. Say, all right, this is a vision. This is symbolic. What are they trying to tell us? What are they writing about? Uh, but all of the Left Behind series, all of that kind of uh, millennialism or post-millennialism, they discuss some of those different movements in there. Uh, they're taking it literally. They're trying to, you know, count down the days and the months and the years and, you know, nail it down. And I think a lot of it is also sort of fear-based, uh, not just fear of missing out on something here, but fear of being left behind uh, that somehow, you know, you're going to be in torment forever. Um, you know, that um, sort of assumes a certain theological world that God would do that to anybody. Um, I don't make that assumption about God. That, to me, seems contrary to God. So easy for me to think those are symbolic. They're trying to write something, particularly um, Revelation, we know, is written in a time where Christians are being persecuted. Uh, and so to, I believe the author is writing about Rome and the Roman Empire and the emperors, um, and but is writing in code uh, to the Christian community to encourage them. I can get right with Revelation at that point, <coughs> turn it into something else than that, I think, leads us all down um, kind of a dead end path myself. Uh, Anyway, they discuss some of those different ways that people have tried to package that up. And now I know we go to what about judgment? Uh, they do a very brief discussion of mercy and grace and evil. Uh, and how did all these things finally come out in the mix? Um, they say, well, there's not been a single opinion or a single answer, a single voice that different parts of the Christian community have said different things about this. Again, I think they have a pretty good line when they say the surest answer is to say that God can be trusted to fulfill God's purposes consistent with God's character. Now, that's not a very satisfying answer if you've got somebody that you really hope is going to be judged harshly. Because um, it's just a little too vague. <laughs> if we're trying to draw some clear lines here between the good people and the evil people, you know, you probably know by now after five classes, I lean way toward the grace side and way toward the side that God's bigger than us and beyond our comprehension. Um, so I don't have any trouble with universal salvation that finally God can redeem all of us. We talked about this a little bit in the sin section. Uh, to me, just as I'm using my Wesleyan quadrilateral to say that finally people are sent to hell. I mean, one, it doesn't make sense to me in terms of who God is, but that aside, that also presumes to me that sin is stronger than grace okay. or evil is stronger than good. Um, that to me seems to be contrary to the Christian hope and to the revelation of Christ. Um, so, but I would say Definitely, I'm in the minority opinion in terms of the larger Christian tradition. Not many of us over in this category of uh, God's got this. Um, finally, God's going to redeem all of creation, all of us included. And I don't know why Hitler or someone who flies a plane into the Twin Towers or someone who murders a baby. I don't know. I, don't, I understand why they should be excluded. I don't understand how God's going to redeem them. But there again, God's so much bigger, right? I mean, if you if you think God's small enough that you get, I mean, I've said this before, that you've got it, God all figured out, that God for me is just way too small. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm willing just to leave that, like what they said in that first sentence, I trust God has got this. I think it's easy to, I mean, we can identify harm in the world when someone harms another we can't identify suffering that genocide or something like that creates um, and i think we probably would all identify and we know that's wrong we know that must be abhorrent to god but i'm and i'm fine with that it's just the next step that says because it's abhorrent to us and we believe it's abhorrent to god um but that's all God's got. That just, that just seems too small to me. Uh, 
for the magnificence of God. So 910, they move on. So what's distinctive in Methodist teaching about any of this? And what they suggest is that Wesley, when he's writing about redemption, emphasizes redemption of the whole creation or all of creation. You quote the sentence in there, I lifted out the earth itself was not something to be escaped, but rather a work of God to be tended. And then they start talking about how Wesley was a forerunner or a pace setter in terms of including care for the whole creation as part of our Christian witness, <laughs> animals, animals, our pets, um, and including that as a fundamental Christian responsibility. Um, so just something to contemplate. Before anyone ever said climate change, 200 years ago, Wesley's writing that we're supposed to be paying attention to those things as part of our Christian responsibility. Um, he was ahead of his time. <laughs> what can we say? <laughs> 9 11 was this Christian hope fixed only on the future. What about today? And they go back to this theological conundrum of the kingdom's present. Christ inaugurates the kingdom and yet it's not fully realized. So it's sort of both and. It's here, but it's not complete yet. So they say God is at work now in our lives, moving us toward holiness, moving us toward more perfect love or more mature Christian faith and practice. Um, and they point out both in our personal lives, we often think of piety or holiness <clears throat> to be focused only on our personal devotional practices. And they talk, they remind us that for Wesley, it was personal and social, the both of those works of piety we talked about last week and works of mercy being put together. They give the example, uh, of course, that, um, I mean, we've talked about before how Wesley worked on spiritual practices. And last week we talked about the means of grace. Uh, but then they give the example in terms of social holiness, uh, how he was fought against slavery again, sort of ahead of his time. Um, so, he wasn't the leader of the abolitionist movement in England, but he was a supporter and wrote and spoke about it some before the end of his life with, uh, who was the guy that was leader of that? What's his name that was Wilber him? Wilberforce. Wilberforce. He wrote Wilberforce and corresponded with him and supported the work that he was championing. Championing. Again, uh, Wesley was just a remarkable guy. All right, that's chapter nine. Let's jump to chapter 10. We have 17 questions to cover in um, chapter 10. So chapter 10 is on the United Methodist Church within the church universal. So church universal, uh, sort of all of Christianity or everyone who claims to be Christian. They begin by discussing unity and divisions and ecumenism, which ecumenical movement was big in the 60s uh, around Vatican II, but the, the ecumenical movement or Christian denominations tried to come together, basically. Uh, so they do some about the history of the Methodist movement, particularly as an example of the Evangelical United Brethren and the Methodists coming together. They were both influenced and guided in their theological understanding by John Wesley, uh, but the there were different groups that ended up being called the Evangelical United Brethren, but basically they were German-speaking people in the beginning in America, and the Methodists from England, of course, were English-speaking, and they talked about getting together uh, in the late 1700s and decided to have the Germans wanted to still worship in German, and that was a problem for the English-speaking folk, and when everybody speak English, we kind of still have that tendency. Um, so they started out separately, but then in 1968, the Methodist Church, which had also gone through splits and unifications during the history of our country, but the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren, who were no longer worshiping in German by 1968, uh, united to become the United Methodist Church. So um, they, they kind of give a little over that history. But anyway, but then they touch on, I think this is key, the idea that the Trinity or the triune God 
or God being three in one, one in three, is key to Christian unity. That is kind of the bedrock piece of what makes you inside the Christian family or outside the Christian family is affirmation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the best explanation for God. In 10.5, they ask the question, what is the heart of the Christian faith shared by United Methodists and other Christians? They say the heart of the Christian faith is the gospel of what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ. And then later on in the same paragraph, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the affirmation that this work of God was for our healing and salvation. So again, it's not something just abstract that God's doing. It's not just about doctrine or belief, but it's about what God is doing for us and how we're responding. So it's a very practical emphasis, I think, at that point from a Methodist perspective, even though they're talking about the unity of Christian faith. They point out that we share baptism and Holy Communion uh, as sacraments, they don't go into some of the other beliefs about sacraments in other parts of the Christian family, um, but we do share those two with other parts of the Christian family. In 10.6, they do a little bit more history of all that. In 10.7, um, they begin to talk about and ask questions about how do we work with other churches with whom it differs over Christian teachings and practices. And they say doctrines and opinions are different, which is very Wesley, and that's what John Wesley says in his writings. Uh, and just as Wesley said, the key is, do we agree on the core doctrines or the basic affirmations of Christian faith? And then everything else is an opinion, as Wesley defined it. And in opinions, we think and let think. Uh, and he says other things along the same line, but they quote the, the think and let think passage uh, there on page 129 and 27. Uh, but as to all opinions which do not strike at the root of Christianity, we think and let think in his little brochure, the character of a Methodist. So um, they, follow, they very much follow Wesley uh, in terms of, and, and Methodism has too, uh, except for a few groups that have split off before and now the global Methodist group that's splitting off, I would say they have set that part of Wesley aside. Um, so they, they talk about the way we work with others is through dialogue and cooperation. Uh, and then at some time with some groups, we write what we call full communion agreements which basically recognizes the other denomination as legitimate rather than arguing with them about some differences that we might have in theological emphasis. So they, they reference the Episcopalian church. Uh, we have some of these others with some of the Lutherans, uh, with some of the uh, Scandinavian churches in Eastern and Northern Europe. We have some agreements that recognize order. So uh, mostly, you know, if I'm ordained as a Methodist, Southern Baptists or somebody else aren't going to accept my credentials. United Methodists have a process of recognition of credentials. You know, we, I know we have a, we've had American Baptists, Southern Baptists, Nazarene, Disciples of Christ. I mean, we've recognized credentials from lots of other denominations. Uh, typically, the requirement to get those recognized is that if they're going to become a United Methodist ordained clergy person that they have to take United Methodist history, doctrine, and polity. Uh, so that they have a little bit of an immersion before they get in to make sure they know what they're getting into and affirm that they know that. The problem is sometimes they take those classes, but if they're rooted in, let's just say the Southern Baptist tradition of you've got to be rebaptized, we end up with Methodist pastors. You know, we hear about that are rebaptizing everybody in the river or something uh, because that's what they really believed, but they wanted an appointment at a church and one of the salaries. So they said, of course, I believe that. And they get in and they practice something else. And as you might imagine, that creates a little havoc. And uh, if you're a district superintendent or a bishop, you get to spend a lot of your time 
with those people. Supervisory ministry, uh, so much of what you deal with is like not because you wrote it down as a priority or something important to deal with. It comes because there's a fire over here about whatever somebody has done from the pastor or a lay person, uh, you know, and it ends up in your office, then you've got to go try to sort out what happened and who did what. Are we all good? Can we live together? How do we make amends and all those kind of things? So uh, most of them, you, at least my style, most of them I could help them talk through that. And we could sort it out. And everybody, you know, could get on track. Occasionally we have to help somebody out of the ministry um, because they're really not United Methodist. So we shouldn't be really giving them authority as United Methodist if they don't really believe the way the United Methodists believe. So, so 10-8 to 1010, they talk about other churches and denominational relations within the Christian family. They reemphasize baptism and open for us, open communion that we we recognize baptism from other parts of the Christian family. Not all denominations do, but if you're baptized within the Christian family, great, you're good to go. Uh, open communion, you don't have to be a member at this church or a member of the United Methodist Church to participate in communion. Um, they point out that the invitation for communion is for those who love Jesus Christ, repent of their sin, and resolve to live peacefully with others, seeking to live new, a new life in Christ following God's commandments. A circumscribed um, invitation not based on lots of doctrinal obstacles. So you would have had to go through catechism or confirmation before you can uh, receive communion. Uh, if you're gonna respond, you've heard me say it in worship. If you respond yes to the invitation, you're welcome to come. All right, they move on to the discussion of ordination of clergy and uh, relations specifically with Roman Catholicism and worldwide cooperation and list a bunch of the organizations like the world council of churches and different uh, groups that we're a part of that have these ongoing sessions of dialogue trying to sort out can we get together what are the sticking points how would we recognize each other how do we pretty much all christians say we should be more unified than we are um, you know to me part of the problem is not so much the differences I think God works in lots of different ways. So I think God works in other denominations and that's great with me. Uh, I feel like the problem comes when uh, people say, well, not only just that we're different, but we're right and all the rest of y'all are wrong. And so when they draw that line, that's a different line than saying, I think we have a different understanding of a particular passage or the way we ought to do X, Y, and Z. That to me is still a discussion and a dialogue and we could say as Lloyd did you know these are fine people or some go the other way and say we have a difference and you're wrong and in fact you're not a fine person <laughs> you know you think you're a Christian but you're not because you've so badly missed the boat on things that we hold as important uh, in terms of doctrinal standards so uh, I just think every time we get into doctrinal standards beyond, like Wesley said, sort of the key core things like Trinity and salvation through Christ, as we begin to expand that circle, we create all kinds of trouble uh, when we try to. It's important for us to expand our, our own theological depth. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I'm saying when we do that and then we decide we've grasped the truth, and if you don't agree with me, then you're outside of the truth. You're outside of God's will. That's really the problem. They do go back before they finish this chapter 10, 16, they kind of shift back to the local level. They've been talking of the big world meetings and all the different councils and groups that we participate in. Uh, and, and highlight four things in terms of how could we at a local level work with people in different churches or different denominations, different faiths. They say we can pray together, we can learn together, we can invite one another to come and experience worship or other things within the life of our religious communities, and we can collaborate 
in service and working toward justice. Um, pretty much that's what Boston Avenue does um, in terms of ecumenical and interfaith relationships. We're connected in a lot of ways. Uh, we share some prayer and worship experiences. We work hard at learning about others uh, before we judge them, and hopefully without needing to judge them. Uh, we invite people into our building, uh, whether it's you know Martin Luther King community-wide celebration or open tables or some of the other interfaith dialogues we've had. Uh, we collaborate. We you know built Habitat for Humanity houses with other religious groups, things like that. So. Um, I feel like we're kind of on track with what they said here, which we are United Methodists and that's what they're writing. So I'm like, all right, we're, we're good. And then they finally end up with just a little one question about religions other than Christian. And they basically say the key is that we should be focusing on, are we all looking for love, mutual respect and justice? And that those things we can do with people of other faiths. Right, we're probably not going to come to a theological consensus with the Buddhist or the Hindus or the Jews or the Muslims. We'll find some areas of similarity, uh, but if our if our goal is either to make them like us or like somehow find a theological consensus, that's probably going to be a frustrating trip or experience. Um, but if we're working on how are we loving and respectful and how do we work for a better society or work to stop harm and do good, then we can work with lots of people uh, without having a theological consensus as the foundation for that. Uh, they, they also point out that we're working on global harmony. Wouldn't that be a great thing if the religions of the world could stop the wars and and stop the madness, so to speak, because we had such consensus among all the religious people that a global harmony was more important than military might. It's a vision. It seems to be <laughs> fairly far off right now it's, yeah. um, with all the things happening in the world. But anyway, they do point that out that that's sort of what the uh, multi religious dialogues focus on and talk about is how do we create more harmony between peoples in the world. Let me just say it's my great pleasure to explore theology and have this holy conversation with all of you. I think God's grace is still at work for good in our lives, and anytime I can share that, I am glad to do so. Let's pray. Lord, we do give you thanks that we have a group where we can discuss and talk and ponder and stretch one another as we look to you through scripture and the tradition and our own experience, uh, that we might grow deeper in our love. Help us to hold close to Jesus and his love as we grapple with these important theological questions and understandings. We pray, oh God, that all of us built feel strengthened by our time together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.